faithful, if you would, to First Kings chapter 17. Uh, I have to warn you, we just used one verse of this chapter this morning, and we were here for 30 minutes or so, so we're going to go for the whole chapter tonight. <laughs> Let that be a warning. First Kings, I want to begin reading in verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Sherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Sherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Please, bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? He said to her, Give me your son. So she took him out of her room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. I think I missed something there. So she took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched, he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he, resi he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Let's pray together. Father, again we come with great thanksgiving, knowing that you are the God of Elijah, the God of creation, the God who has saved us. And Father, tonight again as we look to your word, my prayer is that you would Use it to penetrate our hearts, that your spirit would guide us in understanding, and that we would leave this place better equipped to serve you. And we pray and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In his book entitled Early Christians of the 21st Century, Chad Walsh wrote these words. Millions of Christians live in a sentimental haze of vague piety, with music trembling in the lovely light from stained glass windows. Their religion 
It's a pleasant thing of emotional quivers, divorced from the will, divorced from the intellect, and demanding little except lip service to a few harmless platitudes. Now, I suspect that Satan has called off his attempt to convert people to agnosticism. After all, if a man travels far enough away from Christianity, he is liable to see it in perspective and decide that it is true. It is much safer from Satan's point of view to vaccinate a man with a mild case of Christianity so as to protect him from the real disease. End of quote. Sadly, it just seems sometimes that Chad Walsh is right. Far too many Christians have just enough Christianity to satisfy their own selfish desires and too few are willing to exercise their reasonable service by jumping into the crucible and presenting themselves as living sacrifices. You know, things in Elijah's dime were not much different today. The government had reduced faith to God in, in just another religion. And King Ahab had built idols and temples to Baal uh, in an initial attempt at fairness to all. That's how he was first approached. And in this climate, more and more people were seduced into idolatry. Until finally, Jezebel, Ahab's wife, began to openly persecute the prophets of God. And so the result was that the people who should have been uh, standing uh, with God, who should have been willing to serve him, standing fast in service, began hiding in fear of their lives. And I wonder, if they had jumped into the crucible as Elijah did, I think they would have realized as Elijah did that God always, and I mean always, protects and This is embarrassing. <laughs> Maybe I won't wave this arm as much. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right. Where was I? Where was I? All right. God will always, he will always protect, empower, and prove those that he uses in righteousness. So the first thing I want us to look at this evening is that Elijah was protected. And we find that in 1 Kings 17, verses 2 through 12. Now, interestingly, the Bible does not here give a lot of information about Ahab's reaction uh, to Elijah's announcement that there would be no rain. It does say later in 1810 that Ahab searched every nation and every kingdom for Elijah. And I think this indicates a real desire to get his hands on Elijah, and I would imagine to kill him. And so, uh, you see, the real issue for Ahab was not that Elijah said there would be no rain. You see, I don't think he believed Elijah when Elijah said that. I think he just kind of blew that off. But what really hung in Ahab's craw was that Elijah spoke against Baal. For you see, Baal was thought to be the god of nature that controlled the rain. Now, to predict that there would be no rain was not the right thing to say to a king who had built idols and temples and altars and was himself involved in worship of this supposed deity. And so no doubt, 
when Ahab got over his initial shock of this upstart prophet and his stark prediction, I imagine he was very angry, and he probably would have killed Elijah had God not intervened to protect him. And God did intervene to protect Elijah. But there was a, a requirement for God's protection, and that requirement was faith. Faith demonstrated by obedience. Notice, if you will, chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Elijah was to leave the city, leave his friends, leave his family. He was to go to the wilderness where God would protect him. I think we need to realize that this was really a pretty tall order, even in Elijah's day. Now, I understand Elijah didn't have hot and cold running water or color television or, uh, you know, a cell phone. But I'm sure that his home was far more comfortable than the creek bank. And all he had to do on the creek bank, in reality, is sit there and wait for the birds to deliver dinner. That was not very exciting, I'm sure. But probably, Elijah did some study and some thought on it before he left. And I think perhaps he might have even thought about staying in the comfort of his own home. But in 1 Kings 17, 5, we read that he proved his faithfulness by his obedience and did as God instructed him. You see, uh, Elijah realized something. He realized, as so many others in the scriptures fail to realize, and what we sometimes do not realize, and that is to receive God's blessing, God's provision, and God's protection, we must be in the place of blessing, provision, and protection. In fact, we humans all too often just go where we want to go, rather to the place of blessing. For example, Adam and Eve, they had an entire garden in which to enjoy God's blessing and provision. But folks, they chose to put themselves in the place of temptation rather than in the place of blessing. And Jacob, Jacob left the promised land in the midst of a, a famine. And because he did, the nation of Israel suffered bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. And maybe you remember David. David was strolling around on the rooftop, gawking at a woman who was taking a bath, and not at the head of the battle where he belonged. And so he was caught in adultery and deceit and even murder. You see, more often than not, we want to put ourselves in the place of temptation and then expect God to bail us out or excuse us when we find ourselves in over our heads. So I think we need to learn that God requires us to go to the place of blessing thereby proving our faith through our obedience. Even though normally the place of temptation has greater fleshly appeal than the place of blessing. Well, very clearly in our text, the place of blessing uh, for Elijah was the wilderness. Even though Elijah's home was surely more comfortable than the wilderness. And surely it, it held greater appeal for him than the wilderness. But folks, his home was not the place of protection as the wilderness was. And today, you know, I'm convinced that for every Christian, the place of God's blessing and provision and protection is a twofold proposition. I think the spiritual place of blessing, and I hope you would agree with me, is in the center of God's will, being led by His Spirit. But there's also a physical place of blessing. And I think for the most part, the physical place of blessing is in the midst of God's people. That is, in the church. And just as an aside, I'll just throw this in, there will be no extra charge, that when we read the book of Acts, quite often, that phrase, in the church, 
prefaces some action that the disciples or missionaries or somebody took in the church. In the church. That's the place, the physical place of God's blessing. Understand, it's impossible for Christians to be in the place of spiritual blessing without being in the place of physical blessing and vice versa. Let me explain. We all know that the moment we are born again, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The body of Christ, folks, is the church. And not only are we the body of Christ, we are also given spiritual gifts that enable each of us to edify or to build the church. Therefore, the Spirit leads us to use our supernatural gifts in and for the body of Christ. For example, a Sunday school teacher uses his or her gifts uh, to edify the church. And those who avail themselves of the teaching are the ones who are blessed. But on the other hand, it's safe to say that when a person is absent from the church, that person cannot possibly be using his or her spiritual gifts in the church. Also, the absent person cannot be the recipient of blessing that comes from other people using their gifts in the church. So therefore, if a person is not using his or her gifts in the church as God intended, that person is neither in the spiritual place of blessing nor in the physical place of blessing. You see, the blessing that God promises Christians today concerning all of life's difficulties is not that God will remove those difficulties. The promise is that he will give us grace to see us through the difficult times. And church, church is where we learn about God and his promises. Church is the place of blessing, the place where we learn to be strong in the faith and weak in fleshly desires. So if we are to experience God's protection and blessing in our lives, then I think like Elijah, we must first go to the place of blessing. And the first place of blessing is in the church. You might have figured out. I'm not one of those guys that thinks you can sit home watching television on Sunday morning and receive God's blessing for being in church. Hope you understand that. It just doesn't work that way. However, I know I can get in serious trouble on this subject, so let me clear something up before I go on. Let me call your attention to the fact that Elijah was an able-bodied man. And I know that because in 1 Kings 18.46, we read that he ran from the top of Mount Carmel to the entrance of Jezreel. He literally ran that distance. Now, that may not seem to be such a big deal except for this. You see... He outran Ahab, and Ahab was driving a chariot, had a head start, and was himself trying to outrun a storm. So the point is this. God used a man who could physically be used. You see, our God is not insensitive to our physical limitations. So keep in mind, when we talk about using our gifts in the church, we're talking about using those who are physically able to do so. And before we leave that subject of the going to the place of protection and blessing, notice in 1 Kings 17, 7, that the brook dried up. Now consider Elijah's situation. He left his home to live on the creek bank where he was dependent upon the ravens to feed him and on the brook for water. And just when it seems like he's fulfilled the requirements of faith and obedience the brook dries up and Elijah's faced with another test of his obedience and as I read that I thought to myself over and over why why because he needed a lesson folks 
in the sovereignty of God. Now remember, Elijah was being prepared to stand against Baal, the supposed God of nature, and against a king and people who serve this idol. And so to do this, he must have confidence that the Lord God is in complete control. And in sending Elijah to the brook, God proved his lordship over nature. And he did so by commanding the birds to feed Elijah and providing the brook for him to drink. But now, to prove his lordship over humanity, God sent Elijah to a destitute widow in a Gentile city. And we know from 1 Kings 17, verses 10 through 16, that this woman was gathering a few sticks in the, out in the square. She was preparing to fix the last meal that she and her son would eat before starving to death. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But I do believe that one of the people in this earth that would be least likely to want to share their food would be a mother with a starving child. I have an idea that Brocho would be like approaching a wildcat in some, in some respects. So, however, now think about it. Because Elijah, because of his experiences at the brook, he was convinced that God would provide. And so he told the woman that if she would feed him first, her meal and oil would not be depleted. Well, the woman did as Elijah asked. First Kings 17, 15 says, she and her house did eat for many days. So I think the lesson for Elijah in this, and for us, I hope, is that God is always in charge of our situation. And he will always protect if we are obedient to his commandments and put ourselves in the place of blessing, protection, and provision. You see, Elijah could have gone down to the McDonald's store. But the meal wouldn't have lasted. <laughs> see, I got her attention. <laughs> Second thing we see in this text that Elijah was empowered. Look at verses 13 through 23. Now, not only was it necessary for Elijah to believe that God would protect him, he must know that the Lord would give him the power to stand against a false god, a false king, and a false nation. Now, folks, there's no greater demonstration of power known to man, in my opinion, than that of resurrection. And certainly, if God would resurrect the widow's son, then Elijah need not fear for lack of power when he faced Ahab. However, I think the key to understanding Elijah's power is in 1 Kings 17, 22. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Now, this parallels something we said earlier today. You see, this boy was not brought back to life because Elijah stretched out on him. He's not brought back to life because Elijah only prayed. He was brought back to life because God heard the prayer of an obedient man. That's what the text says. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. John 9, 31 says that we know, and this is interestingly Pharisees saying this, we know that God hears not sinners, but if anyone be a worshiper of God, him he hears. David said in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You see, Elijah's power truly stemmed from his obedience to the Lord, who then heard his prayers. And the odyssey, that took Elijah from the presence of Ahab to the brook Sheriff to the widow's home in a Gentile land was the crucible that proved Elijah was a man of faith and obedience. And therefore, God could hear his prayers. 
Folks, humanity can yield, wield no greater power than an audience with Jehovah. And Elijah is now ready for his confrontation with Ahab, the prophets of Baal, because he was empowered by the Almighty God who heard his prayers. And that brings me to a third point. Because God heard his prayers, we know Elijah was proved. Look at verse 24. Now, to be proved is to be shown to be true. And because God demonstrated his power through Elijah, he was, in fact, a proved prophet. And so I think at this point, if it could be said that he had uh, Elijah was serving an apprenticeship, he was now uh, a journeyman. And this is speculation, but I think these, this woman's words were probably of great significance and great comfort and encouragement to Elijah as he contemplated his calling. I know from my own experience, sometimes we just need to hear from others to confirm what God has called us to do. I think back on my life, and there were some people around me that understood God had called me to do what I do long before I really understood it, or at least long before I was willing to be obedient to it. So other people sometimes can confirm what God has called us to do. And I think these, this woman's words convinced Elijah that he was now ready for the task that God had given him. I think there can be no doubt these words demonstrate Elijah was a man of God who spoke the truth from God, who passed the test. He was proved Elijah was fit for God's purpose. Well, in this portion of, of Scripture, we've seen that Elijah was protected, he was empowered, and he was proved by the Lord before, before he was used for the purpose that God had in mind when he first began dealing with Elijah. You know, I think God's method of dealing with his own people is not, not really different today. If God calls us to do something, whatever it may be, that's not always just the end of it. That's just the beginning normally. And normally we're going to have to go through further testing. We're going to have to go through, the, through further obedience. We're going to have to maybe jump through some hoops as God calls us to do. If all we want, though, is enough Christianity to vaccinate us against the real thing. I think faith and obedience are far from us. and It's doubtful that we'll ever be used by the Lord in the way he wants to use us. Friends, if we want the Lord to use us individually and as a church, if we want his protection, if we want his power, I think we first have to be willing to enter the crucible and be proved. I also think that today, perhaps more than at any other time in U.S. history, this nation needs people like Elijah that are willing to jump into the crucible, that are willing to prove themselves with prayer, faithfulness, obedience, to stand against the prophets of greed and lust and humanism, Claim the gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose from the grave. He's willing to save anyone who will simply trust him. Let's pray. Father, again, we are so thankful for the privilege we have of coming before you tonight. To be able to gather around your word knowing that your word is true. To know that you have not left us without comfort, but you have given us your comforter. To know that no matter what our circumstances, that you are in charge.
but also, Father, we must come tonight taking responsibility for ourselves and realizing that while you give us every opportunity to serve you, to demonstrate faithfulness, it is within our own power to do so. And Father, we admit that so often we are sidetracked by so many things that so often we find ourselves in surroundings in, in which we have put ourselves and then expect that you will bail us out. Father, I pray that you would take these words that you have written and press them upon our hearts so that we might come to realize that even Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, one of the great men of God, a man who worked miracles, a man who prophesied, even he was required to demonstrate faithfulness and obedience. Father, as we look at his life and realize that, may we also realize that we are called to be faithful and obedient, to put ourselves first as a place of blessing. Thank you again for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. And Father, again, we pray that you would guard our missionary team and our pastor. Give them wisdom, protection, and audience. And may your spirit empower them so that many people are saved at this point. We ask and pray in Jesus' name.